This is True Crime Arizona, an Arizona's Family Originals podcast. Hi, everybody. Brianna Whitney here, host of the True Crime Arizona podcast. I know our listeners have gotten used to us doing some updates as we learn more in what's going on with the Preston Lord murder investigation and the continuing East Valley teen violence investigations. And so we wanted to bring you another episode because we have learned quite a bit more in this last week. We've had people talk or or give interviews for the first time that never have both family members of suspects or alleged suspects in these incidents, and then also officials that we really hadn't heard much from before, too. And so we want to get to all of that and honoring some of the victims in these cases as well. Um, I'm joined today by two of our Arizona's family reporters, Alexis Dominguez and Casey Torres. Alexis, just real briefly, what can listeners expect to hear from you in this podcast episode today? So I spoke with Connor and Stephanie Jarnigan. So Stephanie is a mom. She, uh, they live in Chandler. So they had an incident where Connor was hit in the back of the head with brass knuckles. So after that incident, which happened in December of 22, uh, 2022, they decided that they wanted to move forward and push for legislation banning or at least proposing some sort of limitations on brass knuckles. Wow. Okay. So we're going to hear a lot from both Stephanie and and her son, Connor. Um, and then also you'll be telling us about the representative that's working with them and maybe where we're at here with the legislation on that. Super important. A lot of parents following that closely. Casey, You had an exclusive interview this week with a family of one of the suspects, uh, alleged suspects that we have seen the most in these cases. Tell us a little bit about what listeners and viewers can hear from you in this episode. Right. So I talked with Bianca and Andre Fantastic. They are Christopher Fantastic's parents, uh, the 18 year old that right now is facing assault charges for two separate attacks um, that were connected to teen violence happening in Gilbert and Mesa. Uh, Right now, you know, Police are telling us he is behind bars, but I did speak with his parents who gave me a little bit more background on just how he was a troubled teen, what they tried to do to help him, what they were trying to ask police to do to help him out as well, and just kind of how they're saying that he has to be held accountable if he is found guilty for this. So they're not completely defending him, and they are telling me also just how they feel about other parents. Um, pushing for something to be done about these alleged attacks. So they're agreeing with the parents now, trying to hold Gilbert police accountable as well and getting them to do something about these attacks. But we got a lot more insight into uh, Christopher Fantastic. Interesting. And and I think a lot of people know that name. Obviously, his last name is unique and right. people remember it. But in the, in this case, and really just the, the scope of these cases, Christopher Fantastic was the first arrest that came down um, that everybody knew about publicly in these teen violence investigations. So there's a lot more that's going to come on that as well. We want to get people up to speed. There's so much. And actually, if you're watching the podcast on YouTube, you're going to see our desks right now um, is completely covered and just tons of papers. It is hard to keep track of all of these cases and what's going on. So I just want to give people a brief overview and and catch everybody up to speed on where we're at before we dive into all of these interviews. So the the whole catalyst for the East Valley violence um, investigations was the horrific death of Preston Lord, 16 years old, um, in Queen Creek. It was at an October 28th Halloween party. It was a beating death. He was beaten and then died in the hospital a couple days later. It was the investigation into his attack that then spurred Gilbert police to reopen cases of teen violence and also um, ask for tips in other ones. And now they have some new cases as well. Where that stands, last time we did a podcast, Gilbert PD said they had nine open investigations that they were asking the public for help in identifying some of these teen suspects in. On their website right now, you can go and they have this FAQ of everything about these investigations into teen violence. And now it says Gilbert PD is seeking assistance from the public on five cases, two that are reopened 
and three that are new. I think that number's changed because there has been several arrests that have been made, um, most notably in the in and out attack that we've talked about. Christopher Fantastic, one of um, the suspects there, mm -hmm. and then some others as well. Um, in all of these investigations with the arrests that we have seen, you've probably heard the names. We've got Christopher Fantastic, Aris Arredondo, Garrett Bagshaw, Jacob Pennington. These are some of the names where we've seen mugshots. Um, and because they are adults, 18, 19, 20 years Years old, they're being named publicly. There have been several more arrests in many of these attacks um, where they are minors, 16 or 17 years old. Therefore, we don't have them named. We don't have their mug shot. So that's why we're not giving those names. We know what's out there on social media. We know that parents, we know that community members are aware of who these other alleged minor suspects are. We cannot say those names just for legal purposes because they are minors. So that's where Gilbert PD is right now. They're working on five different cases. And then as for the Preston Lord investigation, Queen Creek was the original agency that was investigating that. And then they submitted charges against seven people, both minors and adults to the Maricopa County Attorney's Office. We are awaiting her decision on what those charges are going to be and, and who they're going to be all against. It could be all seven people. It could be a few of those people. Certain charges she could say yes. Certain charges she could say no. So that's where we're kind of waiting on that front. Um, I want to talk to Casey first. We're going to bring you in. This interview you did with Andre and Bianca Fantastic, first off, you did not know if they were going to talk to you. Right. Take me through the process of your story yesterday in terms of, hey, what are we going to do? Are we going to try to talk to Chris Fantastic's parents? And what are we hoping to learn from them? And then we can get into what they said. Right. So this is what we call a door knock. We go out on them many times. We had an address for Bianca Fantastic. We all discussed in the meeting, should we go try to talk to them, see what we hear? Uh, we were just trying to see if they had anything to do with their son's arrest. Did they turn him in or not? We because we were hearing tell. rumors that they yes. had turned him in, and that that's important because they answer that question. Yes, they did. Um, so they didn't turn him in, is what they were telling me. Did not. Yeah. They said police just knocked on their door, and the stepdad said, come out and talk to them. You're 18, you're a grown adult, go talk to police. Then 10 minutes later, that's when we're told that Christopher was being taken away. Interesting. So the parents were uh, very forthcoming. We didn't expect they were going to say yes. We showed up. Uh, we're, I was prepared for them to tell me, leave me alone. We don't want to speak with you. Close their dorm on my face. That happens a lot. It happens more often than not. I don't right. think any of us expected them to talk. As we were talking about this in the newsroom yesterday, right. we knew this was maybe a shot in the dark, mm -hmm. but we always want every side of the story. And that includes the fantastic family side of this right. too. How did this go and what are their thoughts? So what was their demeanor when they did come out and say, we'll talk and then take me through to this, mm -hmm. to what they said first about his kind of troubled past. Right, so they were very calm, uh, both of them. The stepdad uh, walked out first, then the mother. I was speaking with them. Uh, right away, he started talking, just kind of telling me that he was a troubled teen and has been a troubled teen. They actually thought he was okay. They said they police had not come knocking at their door. This is the first time since he's turned 18. He was on the GED program. Uh, they say he didn't have a job, said a lot of teens don't do that, but they thought he was fine. Uh, they flicked through his phone. They didn't see too many alarming things, but they told me that they had moved from South Phoenix to Gilbert because he was troubled and they wanted to try to get him away from all of that. But he was still getting into fights at school, out of school. Um, and then they were telling me that if they ever tried to discipline him, he would run away. So let's listen to what mm -hmm. his parents had to say about that. Chris has always been a little bit of a troubled kid. You know, he's always done a little done little bad things here and there, tit for tat. But um, honestly, a lot of it was enabled by the police. You know, he's had a lot of issues where he's gotten kicked out of different schools for fighting. And there's never, ever been any repercussions for it. You know, there's been issues that he's had where he's ran away from home. The police just bring him right home, you know. And eventually, through that process, you know, he kind of learns that, oh, there's no punishment for anything. So my real issue has just been that 
the police kind of swept all these things under the rug. Once there was a public outcry, then they reopened it. I was not expecting his parents to almost agree with all of these parents who are angry with Gilbert police. I found that to be really interesting from their perspective. Um, Casey, they're mad about these investigations. The public's mad about these investigations. It doesn't sound like anybody is particularly happy with how this has unfolded. Victims' families and now alleged suspects' families included. Um, but there are the parents out there who say it is not the police department's job to teach your child how to follow the law and have good behavior. And you asked the Fantastics about their parenting. What did they say? Well, that's what they also said. You know, it's they can only do so much. They told me they did try to discipline him, try to take the phone away. They said he was even in a diversion camp that they helped with anger management. So they said that they tried to do what they could do. But once he turned 18, he's an adult. What can he do? They did tell me that they had no idea about these two cases or that he was connected to them. Again, they thought he had strayed out. They thought he was okay. So they were... They told me they were shocked when police showed up. Hmm. They didn't expect any of that. And um, the de stepdad was telling me it shouldn't also have taken community outcry for these cases to be reopened and then for something to be done about it. Sure, sure. Let, let's listen to them talk mm -hmm. about this parenting style. To be honest with you, I feel like <clears throat> when we tried to ask the police to intervene and to help Chris when he was younger and when he did the small things, they refused to help him and here we are today eventually when you you're in a situation where the police won't discipline you won't punish you for these things there's only so much we can do i can take away your phone and take away the internet and, and, and keep you in your room but if it's already been established that you can leave the house without punishment due to the police what do you think he's going to do so they say that he's really kind of a, f a flight risk as well um, right. in terms of a runaway, you know, going, coming back, going, coming back. Um, you know, a phone. That's that's my parents. I'm sure your parents growing up um, took away the phone. And, and that's a, a place to start. But obviously there's there's more at play here. Mm -hmm. um, the You asked about the infamous Gilbert Gooms. The way that we have been reporting about this alleged group um it is the, pol the police are referring to them as the gilbert goons because that's what's been identified we know through court records that through some of these arrests one of the people involved jacob pennington admitted to being part of a group called the gilbert goons he said it started from a snapchat group so that's now where we kind of know where this name came from um christopher fantastic is part of these investigations that people have tied to being the goons now gilbert pd is investigating whether they are the gilbert goons and we are still awaiting both gilbert pd and the maricopa county attorney's office to determine whether the gilbert goons could be considered a legal criminal street gang in arizona that has not been decided upon yet so right now we just know it's a potential group of kids that call themselves the gilbert goons but it, it's the buzzword of all of this because that's what has parents so upset it's a it's this group of teens that are almost making it like a clout thing you know we're the gilbert goons and and we're gonna take videos of our assaults it's it's a horrible culture um, but gilbert pd is investigating that christopher fantastic has been arrested for two different teen assaults and you asked his parents about him being a potential gilbert goon how did that go well i, w I had the question in my head that was one of the ones i was planning to ask if they're going to close the door on my face the dad actually just started talking about it i ha had asked him how have you intervened when you're saying that your son's a troubled teen and he just went right straight to saying that he wanted to clear something out so let's listen to it. Yes. Christopher is not a Gilbert goon. <laughs> he's not a Gilbert goon. I mean, these stories, they slant it and they read as if he's a Gilbert goon. He's not a Gilbert goon. He's definitely not a Gilbert goon. I can say that I've seen conversations, mm -hmm. private conversations that he's had with his friends about events that they've had with that same group of kids. They've had run-ins with those kids um, before. Is he a part of that group? Heck no. So it's been a little frustrating that he gets painted in this light like he's involved with that group and this Preston Lord kid. It's nothing to do with that. 
Okay. There's a lot to unpack there. Yes. Um, I saw people upset in our social media comments yesterday by the reference that his dad made to this Preston Lord kid. Um, upset that 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 was the the terminology that was used. Obviously, the Preston Lord murder investigation is extremely serious. Um, And so we are taking that with the utmost um, serious nature as well. But I, so he, stepdad says, not a Gilbert goon. We, We quite literally had that as a headline yesterday, not a Gilbert goon. So we were looking through old court documents to see what was anything that was said in Christopher Fantastic's initial appearances or police records the police reports i do want to bring up um a couple of things so he was arrested both uh in a gilbert case yes. and a mesa case um, i believe it's in the mesa case I'm, i have part of the court documents here um this is quote word for word under miranda your miranda writes the defendant told us the only fight he was in last year was at the in and out that would be the gilbert in and out the defendant does not remember the incident from may 29th stating he used to smoke marijuana back then the defendant said he has hung out with the group from kids involved in the in and out incident so he is confirming to police that he does hang out with the people in the in and out incident and the in and out incident is being investigated as possibly tied to the Gilbert goons. So if that is proven to be something that is part of the Gilbert goons, that would actually go against what the parents said. Right. And the mom said that they've tried looking at his phone. Uh, but she says you can't really know everything in her defense. She was saying that many of the apps that these teens use are like snapchat many of the messages are deleted and disappear and disappear Mm -hmm. so it's not something that they can 100 percent know but the dad the stepdad does claim he has seen conversations and that's what he stands by and as you can hear he was felt very strongly and confident that his son is not a gilbert goon so that's what they say. Right. Um, before we finish off with uh, your interview with the Fantastic family, I, I do want to go into a little bit of them talking about what they claim Gilbert PD has not done with their son and the criticism they have with that. There's been no lack of discipline or punishment, you know, on our end. Um, but sadly, you know, this is the sad state of the world, you know, and it's really an unfortunate situation that he's gotten himself into. And obviously they probably sealed the records because he's a minor, but the kids ran away, I don't know, 10, 11, 12 times. And each time it's the same process. It's parents enact punishment, kid gets upset, kid leaves. Gilbert police says, we bring him right back home. We beg the Gilbert police, hey, can we punish him? Can we teach him a lesson with this? Can we please do something uh, that shows him that this is not okay? And they say no, you know, because he's a minor, their protocol is to just bring him back home. So again, we rinse and repeat. So now he gets brought back home. We punish, we discipline you however we can, stern talking to, like I said, we can take away your phone, your internet access and and all these things. But at the same time, once it's understood that you can just leave whenever you want to because the police will do nothing, our hands are tied. I mean, you can only do what you can do. And so right now he's serving his time. That's how we feel as a family. You should do it. Does it mean he's guilty? We don't know. We also don't know. The evidence, it slowly gets rolled out to his lawyer because there's minors involved. So this is where he has to be if he's unfortunately getting in trouble. That doesn't remove our love and it doesn't remove our support. But at the same time, you do the crime, you do the time. That's the phrase, you do the crime, you do the time. So it does sound like his family believes that he does need to go through um, the justice system to determine whether or not he is guilty. Right. Um, Casey, you ended up reaching out to Gilbert PD yes. about that because those were pretty interesting claims from them saying, well, hey, we have we have specifically asked Gilbert PD to handle our son when he runs away and he's picked up by the police. What right. was the response you got back? They did send me a state law ordinance telling me basically that when it comes with these cases without a warrant, they can't make an arrest without probable cause. And when it comes with minors, they can't do something that parents are asking. And it's different because it's it's an adult versus a juvenile. And so that, I mean, there is a point there that that could be a real issue. If you do have a chronic runaway child, you know, what, what do you do in that instance? But Gilbert police is saying we can only go by what the statute says in Arizona law in terms of the probable cause of holding somebody um, with an adult in an arrest versus a juvenile. And so that's that was kind of their response back. They didn't really say much more other than they literally sent you an ordinance. Yes. Um, I in one of the paperwork, though, from Christopher Fantastic's arrest with Gilbert PD, 
um, it is clear that they are aware he is a problem. It says in the flight risk indicators, quote, defendant is known from previous police involvements to be uncooperative with law enforcement and is also known to frequently travel and stay at unknown locations other than his listed residence. So Gilbert PD was aware, aware that not only was he a runaway, but that he was uncooperative and that they did have an issue there. And so maybe this does beg the question there needs to be more in Arizona statutes or law that they can do with juveniles who have a chronic issue with law enforcement um, if the parents are saying, hey, how can we work together to better this situation? Again, that is the fantastic side of things, yes. and Gilbert PD did not explain any more than sending you that ordinance, so we don't know how Gilbert PD feels about it because they just didn't send us any more. Right. But yes. you did ask. Um, great interview that gave us a lot of insight into the first person that was arrested who's now been arrested for, for two um, incidents, and I know, and I think a lot of people know, um, when you're in journalism, but door knock interviews can really be intimidating. And yes. as much as I'm sure that somebody opening their door is is nervous about talking to a reporter, these can be really nerve wracking for us too, because we don't, you know, we know everybody has a story to tell, but they can be sensitive stories. And so um, a great job. And we're glad that uh, his parents did get to share their side of the story. It gives us a little bit more insight into one of the main suspects in a lot of these um these assaults. So thank you for sharing that. Right. Um, we obviously are looking at the suspects, but we absolutely want to shine so much light on the victims. In this case, we have done exhaustive reporting on Preston Lord's murder and where those cases stand. I'm working on another story about that. Our investigative reporter, Morgan Lowe, is working on another big story about that context pieces that really put into perspective what these charges are and could look like for a lot of these um, minors and young adults going forward in both Preston Lord's case and these other teen violence cases. Alexis, you spoke yesterday to a mom and her son, um, Stephanie Jarnigan and her son, Connor. Connor was involved in an attack as a victim. Can you tell me a little bit about your process in terms of this story? How did you get in touch with them? And, and then what actually happened in terms of why they wanted to speak out? Yeah, so I know you initially had heard from them because they spoke before Gilbert City Council. They've been uh, pretty involved in just the teen-on-teen -teen violence going on in the East Valley, speaking out against it. Again, Connor was a victim. He was attacked outside of the Gilbert In-N-Out um, back in December of 2022. So he... Um, was attacked with someone who had brass knuckles, and it was a group of kids, basically. He said he didn't really know them, um, but they had originally approached him trying to be nice, and then it kind of went from there, kind of spiraled. And um, he said that after that incident, he felt very strongly that brass knuckles just don't really have a place in our community. Um, he feels like brass knuckles are usually used by people who want to cause harm on someone else, that they're never a tool that you would use to really defend yourself. Because a lot of the times when we're trying to defend ourselves, we're trying to use a tool that would get somebody away from you. With brass knuckles, you're trying to get close to your attacker. Yeah. So that's one of the big things he said that kind of made him want to speak out about, about or against brass knuckles and then also wanted to be part of creating legislation that would go ahead and either ban brass knuckles completely here in the state or even um, put limitations on brass knuckles. Interesting. Okay. So we've talked a lot about these assaults and, and we know there's victims, but this is maybe the first time we're hearing um, a victim actually share his personal story with what happened. So let's hear Connor describe that day he was attacked. A group of guys, about 10 to 12 of them, approached us and they were, they started out being friendly. They complimented my car and the sweater I was wearing. And then out of nowhere, the main person who was talking to me asked for $20. And I said, no, you're not getting my money. One of his friends uh, said that the keys are in the car. So the guy who was talking to me tries to get in my car and I don't let him. And when I turn around to grab the keys, he punches me in the back of the head with brass knuckles. And luckily, I didn't go unconscious, so I turned around, and then that's when I felt the blood going down my back. So I gave them the money, and they went away, and we drove um, to a nearby store and called the police. 
and the f fire department cleaned my head up. It took me like a while to like kind of come to my senses of emotions. And then probably after like five minutes after he left, I just like started crying because like I just realized what happened and there's blood dripping down my head. I really had no idea what was going to happen. Blood dripping down my head. He's well spoken. I mean, this is a, a, a kid who's having to relive this trauma. Um, Alexis, when it comes to brass knuckles, and you're hearing him talk about it there, how many states are they legal in? So there are about a dozen states where it's currently unrestricted, and then there are 17 more states where it's legal as long as you have a permit. Okay, so that so I mean that that's not a high number of states when you're talking about 50 states, and and so they decide, hey, maybe we should get involved in this legislation. Uh, and then to do that, you obviously have to work with our state legislators. So who are they working with? How do they get involved? So they are currently working with Senator John Kavanaugh. And this is kind of important to note that Senator Kavanaugh is a former New York cop. So even when I was speaking with him about this proposed bill, he was saying that he was shocked to even learn that brass knuckles were legal here in Arizona. Obviously, there are some cities like Phoenix where you can't necessarily buy brass knuckles, but um, there are plenty of other cities in our state where you can. Wow. Okay. So that's why they got involved. It, it, that note about him being a New York cop, and he was shocked to hear that you could use them in Arizona. Um, that That's a really good perspective note. So Connor and, and his mom, Stephanie, now working with Senator or um, Representative Kavanaugh, um, I want to listen to how Connor talks about getting involved in the legal process with this, probably something he never expected that he would have to do. We decided to write our representatives and ask them to uh, ban brass knuckles. I don't really see any reason for either sides of the aisle to disagree on this. I think it's something we can come together and it's something that will ultimately make our community safer. We're super excited about it and he's reached out to us a couple of times about it and we're glad to have his support because we know he's really respected among the community and he said maybe I can testify and that would help it get through faster and I would just love to do anything to help him pass the bill. The doctor did tell us that if it was about an inch to the left, I could have been paralyzed or killed because it would have been on my spinal cord. So we're just really thankful that it wasn't and we're thankful that I healed and I'm okay now. God, just an inch, an inch and it could have been a life or death situation. That's how scary these assaults are. I know when we're talking about them, we're talking about a lot of numbers. Okay, there's this many in Gilbert, and there's this many in Mesa, and uh, Pinal County investigating this much, and, and they can turn into just a number of assaults, but that really shows you what each assault can become and how scary it is for these victims. Um, you also talked to Stephanie Jarnigan, Connor's mom. The parent perspective, I think, is so fascinating, and it is one that is resonating with so many people who are paying attention to this coverage because they're scared for their kids. And, and the emotional and traumatic impact that these assaults are having and could have on their kids as they go forward really even affects the, the parents from an emotional standpoint. And so I want to play some sound from Stephanie specifically about how she's dealt with this in the aftermath and in the year and the year and a half after her son's attack. It's been over a year now. We're a little bit different in that we were able to prosecute uh, the person that was responsible for attacking him. So we've had closure there. Um, but it's, it's been difficult. Uh, I admire him for wanting to seek change and turn this into a positive situation, which it can't really be a positive situation, but if brass knuckles get banned, we consider that a win. Ever since we found the news out about the Preston Lord case and him passing away on October 30th, the first thing that ran through my head was this sounds all too familiar, you know, a kid was ganged up on by a bunch and then brutally beaten. And it just made me sick to my stomach. So there hasn't been a day that's gone by since October 30th that we have not thought about Preston Lord and his family. And so we hope that his family gets justice and we hope that in some small way that this Brass Knuckles legislation will make a difference and save a life. That emotion from her is so 
palpable. It's so tangible. And I, I think talking to parents and Alexis, maybe you felt this way too, that they felt this violence was out of control in general. It was escalating and it was a matter of time before somebody lost their life. Yeah. I mean, I think talking, hearing from parents is kind of heartbreaking because they can't do, they feel helpless. You know, they right. they've been trying to report these cases. Obviously some families now feeling the courage to actually speak up. So that's also part of this, you know, a mm -hmm. lot of more cases are coming up. Um, but hearing from Stephanie, I mean, even just seeing her is just, when I asked her how she felt knowing that a kid died, Preston Lord, just so young, 16 year old died. And she has a son who was attacked in a brutal way as well. You know, it's kind of hard for, I think, parents to be in that situation and be like, that could have been my child. Yes. So you can hear the pain in her voice because she really does feel like helpless. Like this happened to my kid and now it ha it's happening to other kids. And one child lost his life because of the violence that's going on in the community. And I think that's how a lot of parents are feeling right now when they talk about these cases. They're not just cases, these are families and these are kids that are afraid to go to school. I mean, when you hear Connor in his interview, I think it's also just, this is scary for me as a 29 year old hearing and covering these cases and to even hear you know, how he was attacked. He was confused, he said, that why is this happening to me? Why me? Like, I think, when you think of this being scary as an adult, put yourself in a kid's position, they're still so naive, they're still really young and they don't understand that sometimes these things are happening and they have no control over it. So I think it's very scary for people in the community who are dealing with this, hearing about these cases going on on a daily basis. Um, they want change. right? And I think this is really the step that they can at least take in creating change and advocating for change. And I know the Jarnigans were nervous to speak out. Um, when I talked to Stephanie at a council meeting, was it last week or the week before, um, they, at that point, she, you know, didn't want their last name out there and things like that. And I think the, the good news is that they are feeling empowered by the support and this possibility that they could help create some of this change that needs to go forward. I texted Stephanie before we were recording um, because the brass knuckles legislation is so important. She said that Gilbert council member Bon Giovanni, who is one of the three that's on the subcommittee that's looking into the teen violence investigations with the Gilbert town council. She said um, that council member is working with Connor on an easy petition website, which is no brass knuckles.org with normal spelling. Um, they're working on getting that website completely up and running, but it sounds like Connor has the buy-in and the support from um, council member G Bon Giovanni. And so they were feeling encouraged by that is what she said. And so no brass knuckles.org is what Connor is working working on with that council member. Powerful interview, Alexis, thank you. And you are not done because you were also part of another big story in this whole saga last week. So I want to transition away from the, the family interviews to now the Gilbert police chief. Um, I say that with that tone because it was a much anticipated press conference. Let's just start with the fact that People in Gilbert are angry. There is no ifs, ands, or buts about it. They are very upset and concerned with how they say the Gilbert Police Department has handled these teen violence investigations. Now, we have to know, Gilbert PD is not investigating Preston Lord's death. That is Queen Creek, and now those charges went to the Maricopa County Attorney's Office. But what Preston Lord's death did was open up this can of worms of people saying the people that might be or allegedly could be involved in Preston Lord's beating are involved in these groups that are allegedly the Gilbert goons or are these kids who are perpetually engaging in violent assaults and attacks on other teens. And so they felt the community and parents that Gilbert PD either swept these investigations under the rug and simply said we don't have enough evidence to look into these past cases or just weren't even putting any resources into cases as they came up. 
Gilbert Police Chief Michael Solberg had not given a press conference before last week. He had spoken a couple times at the council meetings, but he had not actually had a platform where journalists could ask questions. And that was something that people were very mad about. Um, even from a journalistic standpoint, we've all been trying to ask the Gilbert police chief, hey, can we do an interview about these things? This is what the community is upset about, and this is their concerns. These are the questions they have. Can you at least address this and give some transparency to what's going on? And, and no stations were given an interview with the police chief. So um, I actually want to go to the sound, just how he started this whole meeting, because he seemed to address that elephant in the room. Thank you all for being here today. I know you've been anxious to hear from me regarding the teen violence investigations. Over the past several weeks, my focus, our focus at the police department has been on supporting tremendous investigative activities that have been occurring behind the scenes. These efforts are exactly what have led to recent arrests. But one of the biggest frustrations we have heard is that people want to hear directly from me. In the absence of hearing directly from me, inaccurate information has continued to proliferate. Violent crime is on the rise across the country. Although overall crime is down in Gilbert, violent crime is up, and that is reflected both in crime trends involving adults and our youth. In 2022 and 2023, Gilbert PD responded to 375,568 calls for service across our community. Of those calls for service, Incidents of group teen violence, being teen on teen violence, ages 14 to 18, have made up less than 0.07% of our total calls for service. Having said that, every call for service matters. We will continue to investigate reports of crimes, pursue justice for victims, and hold offenders accountable, teen or otherwise. Interesting way to start saying, well, I know people are mad that uh, we haven't heard from me, so I'm here to set the record straight. But also, because you haven't heard from me, there's misinformation out there. Catch-22, people want to have him out there. You, If you don't want rumors flying, you have to address them, and you have to set the record straight. Alexis, you were in there. You actually got to ask the first question, um, and, and I commend you. You came in with your facts ready to ask the chief some some serious questions and concerns that parents have expressed. So when you walked in and just as you were getting ready to ask that question, the first question the police chief took ever on this issue, what was the atmosphere like? I think it was... I don't know. He obviously gave that speech, right? Mm -hmm. So you could tell that he had notes prepared. So I think when it comes to questions and situations like this, you're kind of hoping that it's going to be more like a conversation, right? right? You're hoping that this is this is obviously his opportunity to clear things up. And it's his first time to really talk to us and give us information, like you said, set the record straight. And it is kind of, I always tell people this when, I, when I'm trying to interview them on any controversial kind of thing, because this is really your opportunity to set the record straight. And that's what we want to do. I mean, that's our job. We want to make sure that there is communication there, that people have the platform they need to set the record straight. And again, so when I did, when we started hearing from like his answers and we started hearing the questions, I think it was kind of a letdown to see that he was still reading off of his notes. And you'll kind of hear that too when I ask him that first question, because what he said in his speech was also how he answered my first question. Right. Let's roll that tape. People are saying that you and your department have dropped the ball on this investigation and that there needs to be accountability. Um, in this investigation and towards the police department, especially towards you, Chief. Some have even called for you to personally be fired. What's your message to the community about that? We have actively been working these cases. As I mentioned in the numbers that I, I talked about, we have made 22 arrests over the last year on these cases. We, it's not something that we ignored. It's not something that we put on the shelf. We have actively been working on these investigations. I understand there's some frustration that information may not be available as quick as you would like it, but we, we have pursued these investigations. We've been working on these investigations to make sure that we get proper justice for these victims. How did you feel about his response to your question? And I commend you for coming in. Um, 
you know, you were ready. You were saying, hey, people are calling on you to step down or be fired from your job. I think it's the big question a lot of parents have, right? I Mm -hmm. mean, is there a cover up? What's going on here that this has been a slow investigation? It's been a slow process to get any arrests. So in situations like this, you also never know how many questions they're going to allow. Yes. So, yeah, some people say I came in hot, but it's also one of those situations where it's like, I don't know if he's going to let me ask three questions and he's going to get one person or four questions. It's one person per station. So in these situations, you kind of want to start out and ask the real question that you really want to get the answer to. Um, I mean, yes. I think it's good context to have when he says that they've had 22 arrests um, since before Preston Lord's murder and then nine after the fact. But that's also, when you put it into perspective, that's over a a one-and-a-half-year investigation, almost two-year investigation. Mm -hmm. So 22 arrests really is not that many when you're talking about that much time. And they had, at at least that we know of, nine assault investigations where multiple kids are seen in videos there. It's yeah. a lot. Yeah, and I think that also opened the opportunity to kind of start wondering wh- when it comes to these cases, and there are some that they basically were like, okay, we're done with this investigation. We weren't able to arrest anyone. There wasn't enough evidence there. And then they're reopening these same cases. I think it brings a little bit of frustration from families who are like, we're laying this all out there. We're providing videos. We're providing names. We're providing like people who they know, people who we also think were involved in this. I think that's where a lot of the frustration comes from parents because they're like, we're giving you everything that we have and we're putting ourselves out there. We're putting ourselves in danger. We've also heard of retaliation in these cases. So these parents who are coming forward and these families who are coming forward are also dealing with letting police know all the information they have. And then also with some kids retaliating against them and using scare tactics and driving in front of their homes and calling their their home and you know threatening them and even posting on social media you know talking bad about these families who are coming forward and it's scary when you're a parent and they're doing this and they're kind of scaring your family and then also you have your kid going to school with some of these kids yeah it's a pretty unimaginable situation and we have all heard the same thing that you just touched on and the police chief was asked about this multiple times these parents are saying hey we are all sending you the same names the same faces the pictures you guys keep asking we need more we need more tips and the parents are saying we're giving you the tips and we've been giving you these tips so what more do you need besides the video and the names over and over and over again to actually make these arrests the Gilbert police chief was asked this multiple times and here's what he said all the information that we received regarding the Gilbert goons occurred after Preston was killed. We know key players that have been mentioned and a lot of other people that are associated with them and that's what they are looking at is what connection, if any, do they have and who's claiming it or who's not and what what affiliation do they have with anyone. We need to make sure if there's any misinformation because some of the information we receive isn't accurate. Some people will say it's one person but then we got somebody else saying it's somebody totally different. So that's part of the investigative process is to vet out, can we prove that this picture is this individual? Some of the kids have the same hairstyles, the same clothing that they're wearing, and so we need to make sure. And even once we identify, and, and they are correct, they have identified a lot of these individuals. We made arrests on the ones that we've been able to establish probable cause, and there are more arrests coming for those additional. But not only are we evaluating, is this the person? Can we prove it's the person? But as I mentioned about the evidence, gathering evidence to prove they were there and is there any other evidence that we can obtain whether it's through admissions or or search warrants to help prove our case is there a cover-up absolutely not there's no cover-up we have an excellent department we have excellent officers do excellent work every day a lot of people community members parents even other journalists were were disappointed by the fact that before or while the police chief was asked is this a cover-up Before answering that, um, right before you heard him talk there, he was shuffling through notes and said, well, I have an answer for you and was looking at his notes as if it was a a canned response and that it was pre-prepared. And and people said, if it's not a cover up, why do you have to look at your notes? It's a simple yes or no answer. Um, But he says there is not a cover up. Alexis, at the end of that press conference, the first one with the chief that he had had, 
do you feel that parents felt that they had their questions answered and felt better about the way that these investigations are being handled? Probably not. I mean, there's obviously a limit to the amount of time that we had, and it was a pretty long, like, sit-down conversation, you know, presser, whatever you want to call it. Sure. Um, so he, and I, I think it also, it takes a lot of courage, right? He's obviously in the hot seat, a lot of emotions running high. So I think it's also not necessarily... Like, I don't want to bash him because I think coming out and actually doing this when people are already upset at how this is all playing out takes courage. Um, And yes, obviously, the police department was doing a lot of investigations into teen violence, and there was a lot going on behind the scenes, which is okay. I mean, we expect that, right? We're hoping for that. Mm -hmm. But I think it was just the fact that he wasn't necessarily being transparent with what was going on behind the scenes that frustrates a lot of people. So when you ask, do you think parents are happy with how this conversation played out? Probably not. Right. Because I think, again, we wanted more of a conversation, transparency. We wanted him to be like, hey, this is your chance to kind of like talk this out. Like, this is what we're working on. I, it just I wanted it to be more conversational. conversational. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. And it did seem a little scripted. And I think that doesn't rub people the right way when. Yes. It's you know, cases like this where people are, again, emotions are running high. I, w- I would agree. And, and when I've been talking to parents, too, and, and who are following this very closely, have been to multiple council meetings, they they felt that overall, really, the Gilbert leadership has just been so much less forthcoming than the other councils um, and other towns and cities nearby. They want more. It does sound like the police chief is going to be doing more press conferences. And I think that's a good idea. Whether or not they have a lot more to update, you've got to be out there in the public eye. And I think that this community is looking for that kind of leadership as well. So hopefully we'll hear again from the Gilbert police chief soon. Um, I just kind of want to wrap up here as that was a lot of information for everybody. I think this is going to win for the longest true crime Arizona podcast episode we've ever had (laughs) um, on the podcast, but it's really important stuff. And I think that there is an appetite for learning more. Uh, You know, we know how news and TV news works. Unfortunately, there's a time limit with how long our stories can be. It's, It's the basic facts. We're getting out there what we can, but we know that there people want to hear more these longer interviews they want to hear more from the families they want to hear more from officials where we want to provide that context we're looking through court documents you know i'm bringing in kind of some of my legal and crime perspective as to how these charges may play out just based on experience and so we want to be able to give the community parents kids um, and just people who live in arizona um, a little more context into everything And one thing that I do want to clear up as well, because we had gotten questions about this, um, only two of these young adults have been indicted by the Maricopa County Attorney's Office, Christopher Fantastic and Aris Arredondo. Um, They were actually both indicted on the same day, January 18th. But Christopher Fantastics was announced on January 19th and uh, Arredondo's was announced on January 22nd. People ask, why were they announced different times if they were indicted at the same time? Um, And because we do want to to be transparent to our viewers, we were trying to get that answer too. you know, why? Why would one be announced before the other? And what does that mean? Turns out that the reason for the delay in the indictment announcements was because Arredondo had bonded out on January 12th. So they had to serve him with that indictment and those papers while he was at home. Christopher Fantastic did not bond out. He is still in custody. Therefore, they had him right there to serve those papers, to give him those indictment notices, and then get that out to the public. So that is why there was a delay between those two. We obviously are waiting to see what other charges will be indicted with certain people. Um, What will be interesting to see, and this is something that I'm also looking into, You've got minors and you've got adults who are facing these charges. The Maricopa County attorney will and has obviously indicted two of them. She will likely indict more, these other adults that have been charged. But she could choose to indict the minors as adults depending on the charges. That would change everything because we can't publicly name the minors. But in these cases, a lot of them are facing all of the same charges. It's a lot of aggravated assault charges. We're looking at some robbery charges. Um, And so... 
what will the Maricopa County attorney decide when it comes to indicting these teens and young adults with these charges? And will she look at them as one collective group who should face the same kind of charges, the nature of them all as adults? Or will it break down into who is a child, technically, um, and who is an adult? That will be coming here down the road. Um, and so we'll certainly be learning more on that. Um, I, I just want to go through our, our quick little bullet points here and then kind of your final thoughts. Um, obviously, this this podcast episode focused on a couple of main things. Christopher, Fanta Christopher Fantastic's parents speaking for the first time, saying he is not a Gilbert goon and that he's been a troubled kid. Um, Alexis's interview with Stephanie and Connor Jarnigan, Connor, a victim of an attack um, with brass knuckles, now working with a legislator to try and ban bass brass knuckles in Arizona, or at least have some limitations on them. Gilbert Police, that chief speaking um, in a press conference setting for the first time, saying this is not a cover-up, and they're investigating all of the cases. And then, of course, the big thing we're waiting for more than anything is what the Maricopa County attorney is going to decide on the charges in Preston Lord's death. Again, in that case, we know that there were charges that were recommended from the Queen Creek Police Department against seven people. That includes kids and adults. We don't know the breakdown of that um, or who is facing what charges. That is what everybody is waiting to learn because everybody wants justice for Preston Lord. And what happened to him is scary. It is awful and tragic and Everybody wants to see that case through so that his family can have some sort of peace at the end of this. Um, Alexis, final thoughts from everything we've learned this week. I know it was a whole lot. Yeah, I think also one of the things that stands out to me just with Connor and Stephanie, um, they're not necessarily saying that his attack is related to the Gilbert goons. But what they were saying is that in similar attacks going on across the valley, um, there have been brass knuckles used. So they learned that there was the same actual suspect that was arrested for attacking Connor had been in another incident a couple months before also using brass knuckles. And then I also interviewed another family in Scottsdale, a completely different part of the valley, where a teen was also attacked with brass knuckles there. So this is an issue that's going on, not just, you know, with cases perhaps with related to the Gilbert goons, but it, it really is an issue that's happening just among the teen on teen violence that we're seeing here across, across the Valley. Cause really, I think it's also a good reminder just to remind people like this could happen anywhere. And I yes. think a lot of families are saying that too, you know, it's not necessarily isolated to the East Valley. It's something we're seeing uh, nationally really. And then this is obviously something that is going on that we are shedding a lot of light on in the East Valley, but it is happening in other places as well. And I think part of the problem is social media perpetuating that because these kids who are participating in these attacks, whether it's in the East Valley or elsewhere, oftentimes are posting pictures and videos of it on social media for clout or, you know, whatever the kids think that would be a good idea for. Um, and, and so that it, it's sad. And I, I'm glad you brought that up because it is happening all over. We know that there is teen on teen violence and it is disturbing and it is concerning no matter where it's happening so thank you for shining some light on that Casey final thoughts from you after what you've experienced this week right I mean again we did not expect to even speak with Christopher Fantastic's parents uh we spoke with them for 20 minutes outside their front door learned a lot about you know just as he was a troubled teen what they say they try to do to help him out how they say that they were asking gilbert police to do something about this but another thing the mother also said with me to me was that she does not hold what other parents are doing against them in terms of trying to get gilbert to find justice and justice for their kids uh, again they're not completely defending Christopher and they're saying that that he's 18 if he did do the crime he has to serve the time uh, tell me she's not going to be bailing him out and they the stepdad was saying he is 18 if he's found guilty and then does have to serve time he's still young where his life's not over they're hoping that if that's the case he will learn from this right so but the mother was telling me you know if if, if her children came to her saying they're beaten up by someone and in such a brutal way uh they would have done the same reach out to police if police didn't do something about it they would reach out to media and if that didn't work they would just try to go to council members so uh, the parents are understanding 
uh, of they, other parents of other parents, and they can put themselves in their in their shoes. Sure. Uh, but it, they say they understand the emotional toll it's taking on other parents. It's also taking a toll on them. Uh, but again, I think that was just a surprising thing. I, I expected a whole different turnout from that. Yeah. Door knock. I, I thought it was going to be close that door in my face or just saying, you know what, like, we're not going to give you any time to speak with us or our son. Uh, nothing to do with this. They kind of really were a little bit more um, open. And forthcoming yeah. than, than anybody thought. Yeah. Yes. Um, I, we obviously covered a lot in this podcast episode, mm -hmm. but if people want to go look at all of our TV reports or our past coverage, um, you can go to azfamily.com and check out our East Valley violence coverage. There's a separate tab for that because there is so much interest in these high profile cases. Of course, we'll be putting more information out as we learn more, as more arrests happen. And then, of course, as we await um, the charges in Preston Lord's murder investigation. And if you are a true crime Arizona podcast listener, I know you've heard a lot about the Gilbert goons and these investigations in Preston Lord, but we are still working on our long form storytelling podcast episodes that our listeners are used to hearing different cases. We've got um, some phenomenal podcasts that are coming out. We're also working behind the scenes on a documentary and it's going to be a whole new podcast season that will be coming out um, likely in the spring as well. So we're looking forward to that. We're still working on our other cases, um, but because this does have such a high community interest and engagement, we just want to be the place where you can come for all of the comprehensive information in that long form setting, full interviews, full context analysis, um, so that people get the most up to date and accurate uh, reporting and journalism that they can as these investigations go forward. Alexis and Casey, re phenomenal reporting um, from both of you guys this past week. Uh, it was so necessary to what's been going on. So thank you so much for what you've done in your work and then also coming on the podcast. I really appreciate having you guys here. And of course, to our listeners and our viewers, thank you so much. And um, we will be back with another podcast as soon as we learn more in the East Valley Teen Violence Investigations. Thanks. True Crime Arizona, the podcast, is hosted by me, Brianna Whitney, and produced by Sergio Hernandez. It's a production of Arizona's Family, 3TV, CBS5, and azfamily.com in Phoenix, Arizona. This is True Crime Arizona, an Arizona's Family Originals podcast.